Welcome to worship. We're just so glad to have you here in person, and um, I guess the rest of everybody is on fall break. But we're glad you're here. Um, If you're listening online, we're glad you're here too. If this is your first time here at Journey, thanks for being here and being our guest. Um, Please make sure that you stop by that welcome desk. We have a gift, and we would just love to tell you about all the great things that we have going on here at our church. So we're going to start this morning with some announcements. Hey Journey, welcome. We're so glad you're with us today, whether you're in person or online. We have a few things that you need to know about. The first thing you need to know about is that today, from 1 to 4, Journey will be out at Proctor Lane Pumpkin Patch. Quetzal Food Truck will be there. It's totally free to you, and each kid will get a free pumpkin. We hope to see you there. Parents, if you have a kid in our teen ministry, October 29th is our annual Monster Bash. The price has changed, though. Where it used to be $15, it's now only $5. You can sign up on the app, or you can talk to Kyle, our student pastor. We're excited to tell you about an opportunity that you'll have to get to serve the Shepherdsville community that I mentioned last week called Love Bullet Week. It's coming up October 30th through November 3rd. More details and information will be provided in the next week. If you're visiting today, thank you so much for being here. We have a free gift for you just for showing up, and it's available to you at the Welcome Desk. For everything else, you can download the Journey app. Enjoy the rest of the service. Let's stand and worship together. God, I'm begging, please, again, I need you, oh, I need you, walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul, I need you, oh, I need you, your forgiveness.
take a moment, say hello to someone around you, then have a seat. We have a video for you. All right, guys. So it's October, and so I've been thinking about what we're going to do this month with our sermon series. And, you know, it's spooky season, as the millennials like to say. Everything's Halloween. People are going crazy at Hobby Lobby. All that stuff's going on. So I was thinking, like, scary movies are popular right now. Stranger Things was a hit a few years ago. They keep talking about all the series and all the things going on with it. So what if we took a series and we talked about some of the spooky, weird, kind of strange stories in the Bible, and we just kind of explained them a little bit better to people, but also talk about some of the valuable lessons we can learn from those things. So what do you guys think? Is that something you think people might get into and maybe enjoy talking about this season? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Go Team Journey. Kyle, when did you get here? Is that my coffee mug? All right, well, uh, we have a bumper video every week, and they're going to get progressively worse, so just be ready for that. We determined this week we are not good actors, and so welcome to Journey. Uh, we're so glad you guys are here, and so it's October. It's the week of Hall month of Halloween or harvest season or whatever else your church called it growing up, so they didn't have to say the word Halloween. So uh, we embrace it here. Uh, it is a fun time. Uh, we did this series about nine years ago around this same time. Uh, and it was a zombie series, and the series was ba it was great content. The basic idea was, you know, zombies are dead, but they act like they're alive. And so we talked about how that there's a lot of people walking around that look alive, but really inside they're dead, you know, and it's this great thing. And so we ended the series, we brought in these people, and they did like zombie makeup, and the idea was like when you pulled in the parking lot, there were going to be zombies out in the parking lot. This was like the start of the waking or walking dead, you know, all this stuff. So we did all this, we thought it was super creative, we were opening with zombie by cranberries, like we were super excited. And we had this family that was from Korea that were coming to visit that week, and uh did not speak any English and did not have any cultural context for what was happening. And they get in the parking lot, true story, and a zombie walks up to their door and starts to open their door. And they freaked out. And so we said, all right, we're not doing that again. So we haven't really touched anything like this in a while, but I figure nine years later, let's, let's bring it back and see. So the reason we're doing this series and the bumper video will kind of explain it and we'll talk about it as we see more. Um, the reality is, if you've ever read the Bible, and I'm assuming most of us have picked up the Bible, but if you've ever actually read the Bible from cover to cover, there are some really weird things in there. There are some really odd things in there. There are even some scary things in there. There are very strange things in there, and there's even some spooky things in there. And so when you read the Bible from cover to cover, there are, especially in the Old Testament, there's just some really odd things, some, some things that, that we look at and we go, we need to understand this better, and we're not going to be able to cover them all. If you ever want to sit down and talk about coffee or have coffee with me, I'll tell you all of the weird stuff in the Bible, because it's all there. Uh, it doesn't hide from it. But in the spirit of this month and everybody, you know, and everybody getting into scary movies and creepy movies and all of these things, um, I am a fan of scary movies. I know a lot of people are. My, I don't get to watch them anymore, though. My wife and kids cannot handle it. They can't handle anything suspenseful at all. Star Wars is a little too scary for them. So uh, if that gives you any clue. So they can't handle it, but I still love those things. And so every once in a while, I'll stay up late at night and watch a movie. Uh, I watched Stranger Things all four seasons. And so I had to watch that by myself. Nobody would enjoy it with me. But one of the things I picked up on, and you guys probably test this, when it comes to this idea, when we do these types of movies or these types of things are on TV, there's two main elements that always seem to take place in every single one of them. The first is it always happens at night, right? It always happens at night. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, if you think about it, even us today, when we go out at night, sometimes we're a little bit on more high alert and we kind of think of things happening at night. And there's just something about the idea of darkness and the absence of light, which is a whole sermon in itself. But there's this idea of darkness kind of surrounding and the absence of light. And so we see these things in almost every movie that you can think of that's scary. I promise you, it almost always happens at night. There's always something that's going to happen at night that's going to kind of be the catalyst for what's going to happen in the rest of the movie or the show. The second thing is, is that it always happens, or whatever's going to happen in, in the movie, it always happens when you least expect it right? That's the idea of suspense, is that something happens. In, in a good scary movie, if you like scary movies, it's the part where you're kind of just watching it and all of a sudden something happens out of the blue and it kind of causes you to jump out of your seat a little bit, right? Um, and so that's the idea, is this idea of it happens when you least expect it, it puts you on high alert, and it happens at night. Now, 
This is true in movies, but this is also true in reality, right? For example, most of us know there is nothing more startling or scary than something happening to you in the middle of the night, right? A few months ago, uh, some of you guys heard that, that my truck was broken into at my house and some stuff was taken and it was my fault because I'm an idiot and didn't lock my truck that night. And so uh, I'm almost OCD about it. And the one night I didn't lock it, of course, it gets broken into. Um, but what happened next is about a month later, <clears throat> we were sleeping, me and my wife, and about two o'clock in the morning, our garage door sensor went off and the house alarm started going off. And there is nothing scarier than 2 a.m. getting woken up from a dead sleep to your house alarm going off and it telling you that someone's come in the back door. Now, what we found out later was there was some wind that caught the back door and it kind of uh, pushed it open or whatever. But we were on high alert from that moment on. We were on high alert the rest of the night. There is nothing as creepy or startling or scary as something happening in the middle of the night to wake you up from a dead sleep. And we didn't sleep the rest of the night. We, we kept just kind of sitting there thinking like, well, what if somebody really was doing this and all of that? But there's nothing scarier. And so when they make these movies, when they make these shows, they know what will creep us out. They know what will get us kind of spooked a little bit. And so in that vein, I want to share a story with you that takes place in 1 Samuel chapter 3. It's a story that many of you guys probably have never heard. And it's not going to be super scary, but it is just kind of this idea of playing on those elements. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 3, we're going to be introduced to a couple characters. The first one is a kid named Samuel. He's about 12 years old at this time. And then this, this priest that he's been working under, a guy named Eli. And here's what it says in the Bible. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, and pay attention to this, the word of the Lord was rare, which means that in those days that God wasn't speaking a lot to the people. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not gone out yet, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was, or the ark of the covenant. Then the Lord called Samuel. Okay, so this is God speaking to Samuel in the middle of the night. And Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. So he went and he laid back down. Now imagine this, you're a 12 year old kid and you're asleep. And all of a sudden you hear a voice call your name. And you get up in the middle of the night and you run to Eli, who's probably in the next room over, this guy that you've been working under. And you say, hey, you called me. And he goes, I didn't call you. Now, now imagine the emotion in that moment. Like, what do you think this kid's experiencing? He's probably a little scared, isn't he? Now, what's interesting is this, and I want to say this. So most of us in this room, we say that we want to hear the voice of God. You do not. <laughs> It would creep you out. It would scare you. You would, you, would, you, would, you would have to change your pants afterwards. I promise you if the voice of God spoke to you in the middle of the night. In fact, one of the things that we see over and over again in the Bible is that whenever a messenger or even the, the times that God himself speaks to somebody, it almost always starts with this line, fear not, do not be afraid. Because this is not normal. Like, this is an unusual thing. This is a weird thing. And for you got to imagine this, this kid, Eli, 12 years old, right? And this voice in the middle of the night calls out to him. And so Samuel, he says, okay, he said, it, it wasn't me. He said, you know, go back to bed. All right, listen to verse six. And again, the Lord called Samuel. And he got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. My son, Eli, said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So again, now verse 7, now Samuel did not know yet, no, no, the Lord, we'll come back to that line. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. Now this is a really strange story. And, and I realize that me reading the story to you, you're not like kind of creeped out, you're not scared, but, but imagine the emotion in this moment of this kid. Like this voice that he doesn't see anybody, he keeps calling out to him, he keeps thinking it's Eli, but he keeps going over and over again to Eli, and Eli's like, man, I'm not saying anything. And what's interesting to me when we kind of break this down is that when, when God calls him, the voice itself is very distinct, and so much so that he thinks that it's Eli. 
He thinks it's a sound that he's heard before. He thinks it's something that's familiar to him. And so he keeps going back to Eli. And, and Eli keeps saying, like, dude, it's, it's not me. Like, you, you need to, it's not me calling you. At this point in the story, my kids, they do not sleep well. Um, we, we, so if you're a new parent, just don't ever listen to our parenting advice because our kids still end up in our bed most nights, on our floor most nights. We do a pallet night like all the time. Uh, our kids, you know, they, they always said, don't let your kids get in the bed. Well, we failed, okay? So thanks for all the advice. <laughs> and, and, you know, sometimes our kids, they wake us up and we're like, go back to bed, go lay down. Do you need some, a weighted blanket, some milk, some melatonin, white noise, whatever it is, just go back to bed. And I'm sure that Eli is kind of starting to think like Samuel, like what's going on, man? But then there's this moment of clarity. It says this in verse eight, then Eli realized the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, Say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now, now what we're going to see in the story, and we're not going to get to it because we don't have time, is that this calling of Samuel, although it's kind of an unusual circumstance in how it takes place, that this calling of Samuel is going to be a big deal. In fact, this is going to start a character arc that's going to lead from Samuel, who most of you maybe not even knew was in the Bible, knew much about him. It's going to lead into a character arc that's eventually going to lead to a guy named David, who most of us are familiar with. And it's this important story in Israel's history and all these crazy things kind of happen along the way. But what I want to focus on is just the beginning of this story, these few verses where we see that God is calling Samuel and Samuel doesn't know that it's God. He's unclear on who it is. So a couple of questions that I want to ask is of all of us, is it possible that God is speaking to you and you think it's someone else? And secondly, is it possible that God is calling you to something? Now, for some of us in this room, let me go ahead and just kind of lay it all out there. The idea that God might be calling you to something is scarier than anything else we're going to talk about, right? And the reason it's scary for some of us is because, listen, you like things the way they are. And anytime you've heard a story or seen a Bible story or heard me talk or heard somebody else talk about God calling someone to something, what you know is there's a disruption that takes place. And all of a sudden you have to do things differently and see things differently. And for most of us in this room, here's what we want. Let's be honest. We want God in our life, but we still want to do everything exactly the way we want to do it. Right? Is that fair? Like, I want God in my life. I'll come to church. I'll give a little bit of money. I'll do all the things. I'll wear the journey shirt. They're comfortable anyway. Like, I'll do all of that. But I still want to be in complete control. And so the idea of God calling you to something is a little bit scary. Especially something that's going to change things. That's going to get you out of or disrupt the life that you had. We like being in control. And so the thought of God speaking to us is scarier than anything or any story that we could cover this entire month. The second thing is this. When it comes to calling, there's something in the back of our our mind. And you're forgiven if when I say calling, you just want to roll your eyes a little bit, right? Because this is a word that's been abused in our language. In fact, it's been abused in in our culture, right? And so you'll hear people talk about like, you got to find your calling. You got to find your calling. And here's what I know. The older you get, the more frustrating it gets when people say you got to find your calling, doesn't it? Because you're like, well, I've been looking, right? (laughs) You need to find your calling. It is a common held belief, and I do believe this to some degree, that there's something inside of us that wants to do what we're made for. And for a lot of us, we will feel unsettled in life until we find the thing that we were actually made to do. Now, I'm not just talking about a vocation. I'm talking about something actually worth giving your life to, something worth giving your time, your effort, and your energy to. And you'll never be satisfied with anything else until you find that. And so, yeah, there's this idea that we want to find a calling. We want to find purpose in life. Most of us do not want to live a purposeless life, right? We, We want to be on purpose for something, okay? And so much damage has been done in popular culture by the concept of calling that it actually makes us discontent with our lives sometimes, doesn't it? Because we see other people that we think have found their calling and found their purpose, but we haven't found ours. And so it makes us discontent with ourselves, right? And the other thing is this, is we have this concept of calling where we often spend our time being miserable or sometimes chasing after things because we think that's our purpose, we think that's our calling, when in reality that's just something completely 
different. Now, in the culture at the time of this story, a little cultural background, um, what we have to understand is the reason this is a big deal is the people had gotten confused about what it meant to honor God with their life. Now, this comes on the tail end of all the stories we've covered in the last couple series. It comes across after Moses and after Abraham and after these epic, epic narratives where God came through and rescued his people and did all of these things. But the people had gotten confused and forgot what it meant to honor God. And instead what they did, and this is so unfamiliar, right? I get it. They started honoring themselves and their own opinions, right? Completely unlike today, right? Where people just honor themselves and their own opinions. And so the Bible says in verse one, in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. In those days. Now think about it in in our context, We live in a day and age, and I don't care if you're a Christian, and I'm not even trying to make some big statement, but let's just be honest. We live in a day and an age where it is so easy to get information, but so much more difficult to get truth, right? I mean, the last two years, everybody I heard from both sides, here's the number one common denominator. We don't know who to trust. We're hearing all this information, doesn't matter what side you voted for or what you thought about masks or no masks or vaccinations or anything like that or all the racial tension that was in our country. doesn't matter what side you're on. The number one thing that I heard from people over and over again was we don't know who to trust because there's so much information coming out, but it sometimes feels like there's so little truth, right? In fact, would you agree that we are drowning in information We're drowning in opinion, we're drowning in agenda, we're drowning in projections, but most of us, if we're honest, are starving for truth. We just want to know what we can trust. So the first thing I want to mention is the culture that this story takes place in. The culture at Eli's time and Samuel's time was a culture of neglect. It was a culture where the value of God and who he was and what he does was not listened to and was not always considered. People were more concerned about getting their own way and their own opinions and their own thoughts across than what may actually be something that's true. And so people were confused. And when I say that, I'm talking about the people at the top, not everybody else, but the people at the top were confused on what they should be doing. And so they couldn't lead the people, and so now the people are confused. And so this is the time that Samuel comes along and and he gets this unfamiliar kind of weird calling. Now, here's what I want to say about callings in life and, and hopefully ease some tension. I want to set you free from the feeling that you have to find your calling. That's a cultural concept. It's not a biblical one. You don't have to find your calling. In fact, if the texts in the Bible are true or even partially true, the reality is most of the time you don't find your calling, your calling finds you. And this is what happens with Samuel. He wasn't expecting this. And all of the stuff that happens after this story, I can guarantee you this 12-year-old kid serving in the temple was not expecting any of these things to happen. And so many times in life, what happens is the calling, the purpose, if we're open, it will actually eventually find us and make itself clear to us. Now, let me say this about the other side of that, that this story is a weird story. It's a creepy story because there was an audible voice of God that spoke to them. And we all laughed and we kind of joked about it. But I promise you, most of us, even though we say it, do not want to hear the audible voice of God. Now, it would be clarifying if we heard it sometimes, but the moment we actually heard it would be very, very scary. Now, in my life, let me go ahead and tell you this. I have never actually personally heard an audible voice of God. Right? I just haven't. And if you have, that's great. We probably need to check your meds, but I, you know, I'm, I'm happy for you. Now, let me say this. I have never heard the audible voice of God, but I have heard the voice of God. And it's come in different ways. Now, one thing I will tell you about what, what my experience has been, and even what I do for a living, because you would expect this. A lot of people think that somebody that's something like me, they've been called by God. I never heard an audible voice tell me this is what you're supposed to do. What I did know was that there were some desires, there were some opportunities. People talk to me all the time about getting up in front of people and talking. It doesn't bother me. Like, it, it just doesn't. Now, you put me in a room with five strangers, I'm, I'm losing my mind, right? But doing this doesn't bother me. I remember as a teenager at the church I grew up to, they used to do these youth Sundays. And basically what that meant is it was a low attendance Sunday because everybody was on fall break, kind of like today. And so we're going to let the teenagers take over so that everybody else gets a break. And so every year we did a youth Sunday. If you grew up in church, you get that joke. For us, you're like, what are you talking about? So uh, we did this youth Sunday. And every single time, I was always the one volunteered to preach. 
I didn't know how to preach, right? I was still smoking pot at the time, to be honest with you, all right? But I wasn't scared to get in front of people, all right? And so they would just say, well, Jeremy's going to do it this week, all right? So I would get in front of people. And, and there were some opportunities. But here, as I got my life together, as I got into college, I noticed there was some effectiveness. I noticed in my preaching classes that when I would preach, I would preach a little differently than everybody else. And some of the students come to me and say, hey, where did you learn how to do that? And why do you talk like that? And why do you do that? I said, I have no idea. It's just what comes natural to me. And so here's what happened is I started making decisions based on the knowledge that there were some desires, there were some opportunities. God had gifted me with whatever this weird skill is not to be scared in front of people. Jerry Seinfeld had this joke a long time ago, you know, more people were scared of public speaking than death, which means that if you're at a funeral, you'd much rather be in the cat than given the eulogy, you know, I mean, like, but for me, that just never bothered me. And, and so what I found is there were people started to encourage me, people started to say things to me. And what I started to realize is, okay, maybe this is God trying to speak to me. Maybe this is a voice. It wasn't audible, but it was a voice trying to speak to me. So just as God called me to preach and to minister and to lead this church, as we talked about last week, God has called all of us as Christians to do something. We've been gifted. We've been given abilities. Now, the other thing is this. It's interesting to me that when Samuel heard the voice of God, he didn't even know it was the voice of God. He was confused at first. And here's the thing I want to talk about. It comes back to the idea of, of culture. And, and I, want to talk about, I want to talk about contact. Have you ever noticed that sometimes that the voice of God sounds a whole lot just like your voice, right? And here's, here's what I mean. Sometimes, isn't it convenient that people say that God told them to do something and it was something they already wanted to do, right? And so we have to be careful sometimes, don't we? Because sometimes we can convince ourselves and talk ourselves into doing things, saying it was the voice of God when, well, I don't know. People often will talk to me because of what I do and they try to over-spiritualize some things and they'll say, well, God told me to. And it's like, well, I can't argue with that, right? Because God told you to do it. And my advice is to be careful around people, especially those wearing one of these, who run around being so sure that God is always speaking to them, especially in an audible voice. So we say the voice of God, but let me ask you a question. For most of us in this room, me included, when it comes to the voice of God, how have we heard it? And the way that we've heard the voice of God for most of us is through our thoughts, isn't it? It's the way we think about things. It's the way we process information. It's when people say things to us or encourage us or we pray or we read that we have these thoughts in our head that start to build and start to kind of work together and form a path. One of the things you have to understand, and we talk about this in the What is the Bible class that we're going to offer again in the spring, is you have to understand, and this is true, that the stories in the Bible are not normal. And they're not normal on purpose, right? That's why they're in the Bible, is there kind of these stories where God does something that nobody was expecting. And it becomes this epic narrative of this story of God still working within human history. What you have to realize is that most people in human history have not heard an audible voice of God. Most of the people in the Bible did not hear an audible voice from God. But they felt this, this push, they felt this lean, they felt this momentum, they felt this path through the things that they thought because of what they experienced and what they saw happening in their lives and around them. And so the voice of God often comes through our thoughts. Thoughts we have based on conversations, thoughts we have based on after we've prayed and studied together, thoughts about after we've heard people talk or share, and thoughts about how after we've heard people encourage and share with you. And so here, here's what I want to say, because again, the story of Samuel is kind of an outlier. You have to learn to protect your thoughts. Because one of the things I, I want to say is I'm trying to surround myself with people in my life who bring out the best in me. I'm trying to surround myself in this stage of life with people who, who, who want to encourage me to do things. I believe, just like many of you, that we're in a season where we're trying to do important things. I'm 40 years old. I don't know how much time I got left. Hopefully a few more years, right? But, but I'm at this stage in my life where I'm sitting and I'm going, listen, I want my life to matter. I want there to be something that, that counts. Our calling is valuable. My calling is valuable. And here's what you have to know. The contacts you have, your friends... The people you surround yourself with often dictate and determine your thoughts, don't they? You have to be careful who you put around yourself because they will start to affect the voice that you hear with inside of you. 
Because the, the reality is, when we allow certain things into our mind, I mean, certain stuff is just contagious, isn't it? We talked about this a few weeks ago with, with the story of the spies. Negativity is contagious, isn't it? Right? Gossip is contagious. You ever found yourself just all of a sudden we're just, we're just talking about somebody and it starts off kind of innocent enough and next thing you know, we're just trashing somebody and you didn't even know where it happened. You were just like, oh yeah, it's, it's contagious. You know what else is contagious? Apathy. Ah, I don't really care. And so you have to know there are certain people, listen, and I, I know this, there are certain people when I get around them, it starts to bring stuff up in front of me. And in my heart and in my mind, and I'm like, I just don't know if I need to be a part of this anymore. We need people who will push us forward. And so for a lot of us, what we have to understand is our thoughts kind of dictate where we go. And our thoughts are often the place where we hear this voice of God kind of speaking into us. And so we have to learn to protect our thoughts, which also means we have to protect our contacts, don't we? And who we spend time with. Now, so he hears this voice, Samuel, and he thinks it's Eli because Eli has been his main contact. Don't lose sight of the fact that it was the voice of God, but he thought it was someone else. That's important. And he runs to someone else because he runs to something that he's familiar with. And here's where I see, I see people do this all the time, that God is speaking into their life and you know what they do? They run to what's familiar. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not good. But thankfully for Samuel, Eli understands what's going on. Because he has someone in his life that's wise and has been through this and can speak to him. And here's what you have to understand. The right contacts, the right people in your life will always point you back to where you need to be. So this is what Eli does for Samuel. And he says, when it happens again, just say your servant is listening. Another important point about this story is notice Eli didn't say, oh, God spoke to you. Well, you better get out and you better start doing some stuff. You better get out and you better run. You better catch him before he leaves because that was just, it's just happened and it's over. Here's what I want to tell you. If God speaks to you, he'll come back. He'll do it again. He will. And all you got to do is be in position for it. That's all you got to do. You don't have to find it. Listen, I can promise you, God is not playing hide and go seek, right? He has no interest in that. The Bible talks about this. It's, it, there's this prophet where God's like, it's not like I, I was like somewhere else. Like I was here waiting for you, right? You know, God is always moving. He's not ever hiding. Now there's a conflict in the story in verse seven. I want to touch on real quick before we're done. All right. All right. He says this in verse seven. He did not know the Lord yet. Speaking of Samuel. And this is really important because Samuel, he's working, in, he's working as an apprentice to the priest, which means that he knows all the churchy stuff. He knows how to, to break the bread in the tabernacle. He knows how to make the bread itself. He knows how to welcome people. He knows what robes they have to wear. He knows what plates and bowls have to be in place. He knew all of that, but he didn't know the Lord yet. And here's the thing. There's a big difference between the rituals of religion and relationship with God. You can know all the songs. You can come here and nod your head, you know, and laugh because I can be funny every once in a while. You can do all of that, right? And then 15 minutes later, you forgot about everything we talked about because you weren't really paying attention, right? You can go through all of the motions of religion and not know God. And so this is really important. And, and so there, there starts to be this thing that here's what we know. When you start to know God, you can start to recognize his voice, don't you? And you can start to feel the promptings in your life. So Samuel takes his advice. He wants to know this voice. He listens to Eli and it says, Samuel went down and laid in his place. This is an important point. He was in the right place. Sometimes we have to get to the right place, don't we? And I'm not talking about you got to be at church every Sunday, although that's important. What I'm talking about is sometimes we have to be in the right place in our life or we're never going to hear it. Who are we allowing to influence us? Where are they taking us? And some of us, if we're honest, what we have to realize is we may not be in the right place. And Samuel, he gets to the right place. And so for us, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, are we in the right place? And so God speaks again for the fourth time. And here's Samuel's response. 
Here I am, your servant. I'm listening. Here I am. Three of the most important words when it comes to our understanding of God. Are we there? Here I am. Are we open to it? One of the things I tell people all the time when it comes to to understanding like faith and opportunity, it's not that there's not opportunities for God to use us. It's not that there's not opportunities for God to speak to us. It's are we available? Are we available? Now, one thing I want to touch on as we wrap up, we're almost done, I promise. Earlier it said the words from the Lord were rare. Now, let me ask you a question that I think I wish I could go back in time and ask of the writers of the book of Samuel. Is it possible that it wasn't that God wasn't speaking anymore, but it's just that people had lost their ability to listen? And is it possible that it's not that God's not speaking to us still today and speaking to you today and calling you to things today It's just that you've lost your ability to listen. Or for some of us, we don't want to listen. Because as I said, we like things the way that they are. And I get it. Hard things happen in life that make it really hard. We talk about that all the time. And I also get that, that things in life happen that makes it hard and difficult to listen. But one guy, actually he's not even a guy yet. He's a kid. He's 12. He hears the call. He hears the voice. And he listens. And so here's the question. What if when it comes to your life that God's been speaking through the hard things, through the painful things, through the rejection, through the restlessness, that he's been speaking the whole time? We just didn't recognize the voice. Or or is it the fact that we just weren't listening at all? So the amazing thing about the story of Samuel is this. This 12-year-old kid He has this kind of creepy experience with God. He hears the voice of God and he responds. And his response is, hey, here I am. Whatever you have to do with me, do with me. Now, most stories that start with a 12-year-old hearing the voice of God do not end the way that Samuel's ends. But some of them do. And I want you to hear this because the opening line of three is, and the voice of God was rare. And listen to the very next chapter, how it starts. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. Which means it went from this moment of chaos and confusion to one person heard the voice of God and responded. And now all of a sudden, because God's got his man, God's got the person that's listening to their calling. He's got someone that's listening to what he's saying. The word came to, what does it say? All of Israel, a 12-year-old kid. So is it possible that God has been speaking to us? And my prayer for you is that it's not at 2 a.m. and you get woken up in the middle of the night. But is it possible that God has been speaking to you? And is it possible that God is calling you to something? That for us, we just need to be in the right place and willing to listen. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for your word. And God, I know and I believe that you are calling us to great things, God, as individuals, but as a group, collectively, God, that you speak still today. Um, God, you still challenge us, God. And and we live in a day and age, as we talked about, that's drowning with information, but searching for truth. And my prayer is that you continue to speak to us, you continue to encourage us, you put people into our life that continue to to work within us, God, that give us thoughts that let us know that you still love us, that you're still speaking, you're still challenging, God. You continue to invite people into all of our lives that encourage us and help shape us and mold us, God. And God, may we be people that are willing to listen and being open to listening. And God, may we understand that when we talk about calling, it's not that everybody's called to go start a church or preach or do any of these things, God, but sometimes it's the calling is to be a better mom, to be a better husband, to be a better wife, to be a better uh, child, to be a better student, to be a better uh, worker, to be a better encourager, God. Whatever it is you're calling us to, God, allow us to hear that voice in our life, to be able to hear what you want to challenge us with and what you want to shape us and mold us to be. So God, we love you and we thank you. In your son's name we pray, amen. I was reminded this morning, Jeremy, and I've listened to the first sermon. Uh, my brother and I, he's here this morning. We grew up, uh, our parents would put us on a church bus every Sunday morning. We'd go to a, 
a Pentecostal church, so we saw some things that was really spooky. If you've ever been to a Pentecostal church, you get the idea. But uh, I just I remember early on uh, coming home one Sunday and, and laying in bed that night. I, you know, I did what they they asked you to do. You know, they said, you know, if you if you you ask the Lord to come into your heart, you know, he'll he'll, he'll be there with you. And uh, you know, like Jeremy says, you know, you don't hear anything or you know the present you know, don't hear God say yes you're now saved or anything like that but I, I did I laid there and I, I said that little prayer and and uh, you know I, I don't know so much about hearing the voice of God but I do believe in the presence of God for sure but as a young kid not really you know nobody to guide me our parents didn't go to church with us or anything like that it scared me and I was the kind of guy to hang out with Jeremy in the parking lot I said a bunch of cuss words you know just just oh you know what is this thing but I, I say that because I think that the communion, you know, I'm much older now and I, and, and I understand, I think, more, you know, what that was. And here in communion, that, that's what it means for me mostly now is, is a time to just commune and be with the presence of God. And I'm not necessarily something, you know, not a, it every time I take communion, something doesn't come over me or scare me or make me feel good. But, but I'm always reminded of the goodness of God and how good he is and that that even though I might have said those cuss words to try to scare it away, it didn't leave me. You know, I might have walked on or done some other things, but but God's always there. So as we take communion, let's just just, just be reminded of that fact that, that God is always, always near. We're going to play a little bit, and then as we start singing, you guys can just join.
your love Radiant diamonds Burst in its eyes We cannot contain Your love Will surely come back
worshiping with you all this morning, please make sure that you stop by Proctor Lane um, Pumpkin Patch. It's off 44 in Shepherdsville. We are there from 1 to 4, and you can come by anytime. We'll see you back next Sunday.